Hello and welcome. This is Becky Norwood with from the woman I love, and this is our second interview from the We Choose to Thrive series. We Choose to Thrive is the stories of women who have chosen to heal, not just heal, but to thrive after a childhood or um, even into adult years of sexual, emotional, and physical abuse at the hands of a family member. Nache has this beautiful story of courage, of determination, a sweetness about her, and a, and a true grit for the, and passion for being able to heal. Enjoy her story. It's a pleasure to get to meet you. I know. Yay. Tell me a little bit about what you're doing right now. So I am doing a corporate job, uh, program management, but then also I started a makeup company that... I take the proceeds from sales and teach sexual assault survivors and domestic violence survivors how to apply makeup and also give them product. That's been going on since February. So that's like one of my biggest things to focus on right now. And then I'm also coaching strength and conditioning on top of volunteering. <laughs> you have such a beautiful smile. Thank that's you. And so I'm really pleased to hear what you're doing. Thank you for, for being willing to be a part of this. Shay, can you give us just a story on what happened for you? Uh, the abuse started when I was nine, and it went until I was 18. And I actually had m repressed all memory of it. Um, I actually have dissociation disorder, dissociative disorder, um, which I still deal with today. But um, once I had my daughter, she's 10 now, so once I had her, she was about a year old. I had my memory resurfaced. And it was kind of like a bunch of bricks, a brick wall mostly, hitting me along with a semi-truck. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was a process. Uh, I had to process all of that. I had gone through a lot of depression, deep, deep depression in middle school and high school, um, suicidal tendencies. I mean, everything that you could possibly think of as far as trauma, like coping, book of the book of trauma coping. I had everything. I ended up telling my parents. I was 22 by that time. It was kind of a process to figure out what I wanted to do. My parents didn't really do anything about it. They kind of left it up to me. I think six years later, he attempted to come to my house. It was my grandfather. And he attempted to come to my house and come into my house. And that was when I was like, oh, he really doesn't know what he did. He doesn't think it's okay. Or he thinks it's okay. And I went through the process of filing a criminal complaint. We ended up going to trial. Uh, quite a few people have come out of the woodworks as far as uh, saying that he had molested them and abused them as well. Um, but because of statute of limitations, it was really just my case. And they were kind of like character witnesses. And he ended up plea bargaining and receiving three years, and he served about a year and a half. Mm. Wow. Yeah. It's an amazing, amazing story that you had the courage to do that. That speaks a lot to your character, but it's something that, too, too bad it doesn't happen more often. Yeah, and that's kind of my... My goal is to bring awareness, obviously. Um, I use a lot of my platforms for that as far as social media and helping people realize that they have a choice, that I, they don't necessarily have to file criminal charges, but at the same time, they also have to confront the people that they feel like they needed to have support with or from, because that was my biggest thing, that the molestation wasn't that big. I mean, it is a big deal, but... In the end, in the long scheme of things, the bigger scheme of things, it was more of the people that were supposed to be there and support me and how this has been like a family secret for mm -hmm. so long. And nobody wanted to step up, and I could have been prevented, but it wasn't because everybody was sweeping it under the rug. And that was kind of like my, my, final, my final straw was he obviously doesn't care. Right. You know, that is so the story. It's the recurring theme. It's my thing, too, is that, the family history is just very confusing and, and just m messed up. So for me, it's like, okay, well, if, Ken if it was my daughter, Kennedy, if it was Kennedy, he wouldn't, if it was my dad and it was Kennedy, he would not be alive. I would have went off the deep end and done whatever I wanted to because that's not something that 
I can go to sleep at night knowing that I didn't do anything, I guess. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of my, that's where the struggle has been in my healing process. It's been years and years of therapy, but it's finally kind of progressing where I for, I'm starting to forgive people. And it's very interesting to see the difference in, in mindsets, especially when you approach people and ask them why didn't they do this or why didn't they, you know, why didn't they speak up? And it's very like, oh, I didn't know what you wanted me to do. I've had conversation with my family members too. And now I'm 60 this month and, mm -hmm. and I'm just now having the courage to speak up and I've had conversations. Most of it was, well, we didn't want to rock the boat. Where are you right now in your healing path? You're, you're doing some remarkable things. How do you feel you're doing in your, in your healing path? What's going on? I think I'm at peace. Um, just knowing that I had no part in anything. I didn't do anything wrong. It took me years and years and years to come to understand that fully and understand that it's nothing, I mean, nothing that I did would have ever prevented what, how he is. For me, a big part of the last step of healing and, and getting out of that mindset of like poor me and victimizing myself was to help others. And so just by volunteering, I, I've been volunteering at the YWCA and, and doing like uh, sexual assault response teams. And just by going through the training, it kind of opened my eyes to, yes, this is like a, this is a bigger problem than just a few select people. Like, this is a huge epidemic. It's massive, it's massive yeah. isn't it? Yeah, and it's, it's, it's sad and it's really disgusting to me. But at the same time, obviously, there's, we are not alone. And so that is kind of my, I think it's my saving grace, knowing that I'm not the only one that's going through this. And not even, I'm not even the only one that's gone through memory repression no, no. to this extent. All the ladies that I've been interviewing for this book, we all say the same thing. So much of it, I can't remember. Yeah. And, yeah. and also this self-destructive tendencies that, that we have, whether it's addiction to sex or drugs or suicidal tendencies, it's always a self-destructive thing because we have our self-worth is so at stake. Right. Absolutely. My mom would always be like, I didn't understand why you were so depressed and, you know, you were cutting all the time and I skated for 11 years. One day I just was like, I don't want to do this. It doesn't make me happy anymore. And my mom was like, what? Like, that is so crazy. But it was just me pulling away from everything that made me happy. Managing your pain. Yeah. Yeah. So what's been the most positive thing that you've ever done for yourself to overcome the trauma of your past? It would definitely be going to court and not necessarily the whole court process, but not even, um, not even testifying, but actually my impact statement, my impact statement still, when I'm feeling, you know, on the days that you feel down, I'll read it and I'm like, oh, okay, I'm, I'm better. So what is your impact statement? Do you, are you able to um, share that? Yeah, I can share it with you. It's, it's long, so I can send it to you. Okay, wonderful. Um, but yeah, it was just on his uh, sentencing day. Uh, it was funny because, you know, I went through this whole, t I went through processing this pretty much by myself because I didn't really want to drag anybody into this like super darkness that I had. I kind of reached out to people on sentencing day and, or about sentencing day. And I was like, Hey, I'm going to do this impact statement. Like if you want to come, you know, my situation, like you can come. And it ended up that there was about 25 people in the courtroom wow. and they all, maybe four of them talked or spoke, but everybody else was just there just because they wanted to be there. And I think that was more so impactful on, on my, on coming out of the trauma is seeing that there were people there to support me when I didn't think that they there would be. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's why when I read the, my impact statement on down days, it's the uh, the love that I could feel in that courtroom was is more so than the actual speech, if that makes sense. It does, very much so. I'm so proud of you. And, and you know, you have a glow about you, a beauty about you 
that that shows it shines through your that, that you're strong and you're doing so much to stay on top of it thank you it's really Fabulous. So what words of wisdom could you offer to somebody that's just starting down that road of healing? Oh, there's a lot of words. <laughs> <They're small. laughs> I would just say that you're really not alone. Like it's, it really feels like you are. And I think you as trauma, as trauma survivors, we tend to isolate ourselves just because of our self or our internal self value. And yeah, and it's like hide me away from the world because nobody understands. But in reality, there's a lot of people that understand. And I wish that I would have, I guess, reached out or used resources more. Because, I mean, just even looking at the YWCA and, and RAIN, like all the things that they do to support survivors. I just wish that I had participated in it when I started my healing. So I think more so just like reach out. And and there's people that will reach out to me now on social media and like, hey, you know, this happened to me and I, I just want to know, like, how do I start? Where do I go? And to me, that's like, that's probably a much stronger person than I was when I started. I tell people a lot is like, okay, well, what one in, one in four women are, by the time they finish college, have been sexually assaulted or some in some way or another. And I was like, but yet that's underreported. So what is it? One in two? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And people were like, what? I'm like, yeah, it's grossly un underreported. It's, yeah. it's bad how underreported it is. One lady I, I interviewed said that she felt in truthfulness that it's four out of five. I could see that. And that is just heartbreaking. But I think that it's closer to accurate. That is, I completely agree. That's probably the most, more accurate than anything that I've ever, like I, the statistics are just so hard to even look at it in general and just knowing that not everybody has reported it is even worse. Journey, what resources would you suggest somebody reaches out to to use? Um, I would say, I mean, RAIN, uh, Rape, Incest, Abuse. National Network. I mean, they have a really great website to go to if there's any, like, find, trying to find resources and they redirect our organizations that are close in in your city in proximity and I think that's probably one of the best things that I have found even though I didn't really need them at that point in time and then I would also say the one thing that like really works well for me is journaling and stuff writing down my therapist actually recommended it's like a workbook it's called the courage to heal and that workbook has helped me a lot too and even if you're not seeing therapist going through it and writing down your answers is very cathartic trying to sit down and write a memoir but I can't like every time I start writing I'm like oh do I start there where do I start I have no idea where like I don't know what to do so then I'm just like this is too much for me like I gotta walk away but yeah I can see that's um that's what I do for a living that's you know it's part of what I do is mm -hmm. I've been helping people for four or five years to tell their stories and then I didn't tell mine <laughs> <laughs> yeah and so, so finally, like, I'm like okay I'll tell my story <laughs> oh it has been the most healing thing I think I've ever done I have really uh bad dis well I wouldn't say bad because there's other people that are even worse but this is my di my disassociative disorder tends to be like when I'm stressed out or when I'm exhausted it kind of just comes up mm -hmm. and there's days where I'll remember I don't know, maybe two hours of the day, and then there's other days that I'll remember most of the day. But it's it's very interesting because that's always something that I'm conscientious of, is making sure that I am in always in a mental, like a mental and emotional, I guess, plateau. So I'm not freaking out and I'm not going into depression. And always trying to do self-care to make sure that I stay at that level where I'm not worried. I don't have to worry about what's going to happen or how I'm going to have an emotional outburst. That is so beautiful. I so appreciate your sharing and being so willing to be a part of this. Your story is phenomenal. Thank you. I applaud you. You're welcome and thank you. I love this idea. It's a great idea. Thank you, Nishay Martinez, for such an inspiring and well 
done interview. We appreciate you very much. On behalf of myself and Nishé, we want to thank you for listening to this interview. This is part of our We Choose to Thrive series offered by thewomanilove.com. We Choose to Thrive is the stories of many women rising in unison to become messages, messengers of hope and inspiration for those that are just now starting through their journey of healing, not just healing, but thriving after a history of abuse. If you or someone that you know has um, fits this description and wants to participate, we are continually taking interviews. It's going to turn into a book series and a documentary. We would invite you to be in touch with us at thewomanilove.com. Thank you.